Hello, everyone. I'd like to wish you all again a happy Nurses Week and thank you for joining us. My name is Misty Fortier and I act as the Director of the Credentialing Centre and Nursing Policy at the Canadian Nurses Association and I am pleased to be your moderator for today's session. This year, our Nursing Week theme is Changing Lives and Shaping Tomorrow. The theme recognizes the contributions and the tremendous impact that nurses have on individuals, communities, and the changing future of healthcare. We are more than pleased to continue our Nursing Week events with Mary Lou Ackerman today to really highlight how nurses may shape tomorrow through innovations in healthcare. We wanna take a moment again to thank CeraVe for their support of both nurses and the Canadians who we serve and access healthcare. They've generously sponsored all of this week's events. Just a few housekeeping issues before we start. Please note that this webinar, as well as any of our other webinars being held as part of Nursing Week celebrations are being recorded and will be made available online through our YouTube channel. Due to the large number of participants, participants that we expect to be joining us today, the chat and emojis have been disabled. Please use the QA button on the bottom of the black ribbon of the Zoom window to ask any questions. This feature may be used at any time during the presentation. Any questions submitted during the presentation will be answered directly by either CNA staff, if it is a CNA related question, or will be shared with our presenter at the end of her presentation. Before we introduce Mary Lou, I just want to say that we at Canadian Nurses Association wish to acknowledge that the land upon which we are gathered today for thousands of years has been the traditional land and home of diverse First Nation, Inuit, and Métis people. I would also like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work and play on this land. We pay our respects to Indigenous people past and present and reaffirm our relationships with one another. I make this acknowledgement with, with the recognition that we are a community of nurses that have a responsibility to learn the harsh and devastating impact colonialization has had on Indigenous peoples past and present. I would like to now introduce our guest speaker for today. Mary Lou Ackerman has been a long-term employee at SE Health and a founding member of Sanciel, the Society of Nurse Scientists, Innovators, Entrepreneurs, and Leaders, where she is the executive board member and president-elect. Her background is very extensive. She has led the development and implementation of many health transformation projects, innovations, and partnerships. Mary Lou joined SE Health early on in her nursing career, and she has augmented her clinical background with a graduate business degree and significant experience with health informatics and technology. We are so pleased at CNA that we have partnered with SC Health and Sanciel over the past year to bring nursing innovation to the forefront in Canada. So I really want to welcome Mary Lou and I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Misty. I'll just uh, take a moment here to share my screen. Um, oh, Misty, you well, have to I just want to stop share, sorry. Yeah, no <laughs> there we go. Um, okay. This is looking a little different. Let's try something here. It is not showing my presentation. Just give me one second here for some reason. I have my presentation open, but it, oh, maybe I gotta go here. Show all windows, there it is. Perfect. Okay, good. First hurdle, first hurdle crossed. But thank you, Misty, for the nice introduction and uh, more importantly for the invitation to share uh, on this webinar today. I wanted to, um, you know, spend some time sharing my experience and some of the thoughts and examples of some wonderful nursing innovation that's already happening um, and sort of our vision together with CNA and Sanciel for the future of nursing innovation in Canada, which is really going to help us to move from what we, we call today as our best practice to next practice. But before I get started, actually, let me just go into slide mode here. 
Before I get started, I just wanted to um, wish you all a very happy Nurses Week. I know it's uh, one week a year is not nearly enough to recognize the contribution that nurses make, um, but it's great that we have this week and it's it's your time to take some time and and uh, pat yourselves on the back and pat other nurses on the back and really be grateful for the impact that we're able to make to uh, the lives of uh, patients and their families as they're going through uh, some significant concerns in their life. So happy Nurses Week to all of you. So a little bit about SE Health. Um, SE Health is some of you, hopefully most of you know us, we're uh, 115 years old this year. And um, our main purpose, our vision is to bring hope and happiness. And that really is rooted in the culture of the organization. So for every sort of care exchange or every experience, every experience we're having with each other, we're reflecting on the impact we're making from the lens of, are we giving each other and those we serve hope? And are we creating happiness where, where we can? So we have um, almost 10,000 staff now across the country. Uh, we are 115 years old. Do we do about 21,000 care exchanges a day? And these exchanges happen in people's homes. They happen in schools. They happen in uh, long-term care facilities, in hospitals, in clinics, uh, by, by nurses, therapists, personal support workers, nutri nutritionists, et cetera. So our vision really is to really make sure that we're having an impact on people across the country and uh, as a social enterprise as well around the world. So we do a lot of um, consulting globally. Our mission as a not-for-profit is, and a social enterprise, we work, uh, we are a not-for-profit organization, but we work like a for-profit organization in that we're constantly looking at ways to be more effective and more efficient. And then how do we use those dollars that are, are saved in the delivery of care uh, to better create the next care experience? So through research, through um, innovation. And our, our values are based on life care, love, and working with purpose. So from 1908 to 2019, I wanted to spend a little bit of sort of pre-COVID time and talk about our who we were as an organization as it relates to innovation. So we have this kind of showcase hall in the off in the office, and it really describes how we have um, been innovating since 1908. Um, you know, leaders in uh, sort of the first organization to do home dialysis, first organization to care for individuals with um, uh, AIDS, the first uh, organization to do um, home infusion therapy, the, all, all of these kinds of different firsts. So we've been known to sort of always want to challenge the status quo and find solutions. And through that, we have developed over the last probably 10 years, a bit of a methodology that helps us to do these, these things. And the methodology was really based on figuring out is, is what we're trying to do desirable, viable, and feasible for the organization. And if it did match up to these three things, we called that our sweet spot. And it sort of allowed us then the confidence to move forward in um, you know, that those changes that needed to happen. In order to really understand whether or not something was desirable, feasible, and um, uh, viable, we had to have a methodology that would help us do that. So we had this uh, sort of four-step process that we used to kind of, you know, better on this, understand the problem, look at solutions and test those solutions. And I'll, I'll go into this a little bit deeper uh, later on in the presentation, but it was, in, it was really key to us to standardize and understand what the steps, what was needed in order for us, for us to really be sure that this was desirable for the patients we served or the staff that we had working with us, whether or not we were solving the right problems and uh, whether or not those solutions were really the right solutions to be using. Prior to having this methodology in place, 
our innovation was more based on on um, opportunities that were presented to us. For example, the need for in home chemotherapy. Then we would we would work through a model or process to sort of develop that care delivery. But it what we weren't seeking out the problems to solve. Whereas now it's over the last, I would say 10, 15 years, it's been more embedded of us to really status, challenge that status quo and move forward. So when we talk about, you know, the future today and what what things are look, what's really driving some of that need is we have some great clinical best practices. We, you know, we've got some really sound evidence and, um, processes for, for driving forward new evidence for practice. We also have this desire to make this social impact as an organization. So not just um, changing for SE Health and SE Health patients, but how do we impact um, those in our communities, those in our province, country, world, um, and as well, a huge movement towards digital technology and how can that support um, nursing care? So it's kind of these three things that have been our driver towards next practice. And we see a lot of trends, you know, especially in the digital health space that's driving, continuous to drive us forward, like digital assistance. You know, most homes, I think it's uh, up in the 70% of homes now have some sort of Alexa or Google Chrome thing in their home. So the sort of the voice is the future. Um, definitely smart homes. We're starting to see those involved where you know there's different sensors put in people's homes to identify that they've left the stove on or it's time to turn down the heat or um, now you're seeing even more more um, intelligent sensors where it can predict changing behaviors, those sorts of things. Lots of artificial lots of stuff with AI and artificial intelligence, looking at data to sort of be able to create um, predictive personalized care regiments for individuals and also new new types of relationships that um, are forming because people are becoming far more comfortable with these machines you know the the alexas in their homes but then 2020 hit and uh, we all know all too well what happened there with uh, the pandemic and covid and the humongous impact it had on our healthcare system you know, the world did change in a minute, in a blink. We had this tidal wave of something heading our way, but we weren't really sure exactly what it was or what its impact was going to be, but we were seeing pieces of impact all over the place and, and presenting itself in different ways. You know, how people reacted to having COVID. Some some had a cold, some were in ICU, some, some didn't survive. You know, so very limited inf information, very unpredictable. And with that as well, a significant impact on our resources, our healthcare, health human resources, which were already strained pre-2020. So we had, you know, in all of our different health systems, basically SWAT teams were formed to figure out how do we best support and care for those in need, how do we keep those those who don't have COVID safe from COVID? Uh, we saw some great collaboration uh, locally uh, across the health system and global and globally as well. Uh, traditional barriers around regulations and um, competition and and different things all bit, all crumbled. So so our world for innovation kind of opened up a little bit, and the sharing and caring was really amplified. You know, it was the first time in my, you know, 37 year career that uh, I that I saw a tremendous collaboration to sort of really, everyone focused on what was most important and that was meeting the care needs of the individuals. So the barriers crumbled. We had tremendous impact. We saw uh, healthcare anywhere being delivered everywhere. Um, we sh we saw healthcare providers working together who never worked together before. So really, really a, a a crisis that you know really did drive huge opportunity. Innovation exploded, 
and what we, we've coined as the pandemic pace very, very quickly. What was really identified there that, you know, we have not Maslow's hierarchy of needs and this, ident this need to be connected to health in a very different way was almost one of those, one of those key needs that Maslow now needs to add to the bottom of this uh, pyramid. So really the future of health arrived in 2020. It changed in a heartbeat. We saw that, you know, if, from our experience that patients were afraid to have us come into their homes. Clinicians were afraid to go into homes, uh, but necessity of care was driving this real need for innovation. So this is really basically saying, you know, that the base, because of fear, uncertainty and concern, the, you know, there was this collision between available resources and, and the needs of the patients. So then we had to really look at where we are now because we were looking at you know, a bunch of different solutions. But when we look back and learn from that experience, one of the things we, we landed on was you know, that those girl guides were right. We need to be prepared. This can be, and prepared for the unknown. We may not have a pandemic again, but there, there are different unknowns that we don't even know about yet that could, could impact us. Number one, access to care was critical. And that was the, a huge barrier during the pandemic. So how do we make, ensure that access to care is always available? The other big learning through that whole experience was that managing risk is possible and tolerating some risk is, access, is acceptable. And we call this intelligent risk taking. And prior to the pandemic, it was really hard to move forward anything you know, move forward innovations because of all of the regulations around risk and not the willingness to look at how we might mitigate risk. So this whole concept of, you know, when you're doing innovation now, um, to have this message that, you know, managing risk really is possible. Oops, sorry. Um, and the other one was uh, resilience and persistence really rose to the forefront. So we were willing to try and keep trying and keep pivoting until we got it right very quickly. We didn't sort of take one solution and, and try it and then keep making that same solution, trying to make it work when it wasn't going to work. There wasn't sort of that willingness to kind of pivot our direction a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left until we found that spot that was gonna work. And lastly, as a health system, I think we learned that we work better together. So the change that came of this model for us was where we had this, what we call the sweet spot now, what we really wanna move forward is if we lead with caring, if we lead with that access to care, that is should drive the solutions around what's desirable, feasible and viable. Has it impacted on individuals, quality of care, access to care primarily, and our ability to provide that care. The other thing we added to this diagram, bring it back to you and I'll go in a little bit more detail to this now, is it needs to be based on some intelligent risk taking. It, you know, we need to understand any risks that we're bringing in because when there's something new, we don't have the evidence. That's what we're doing. We're generating new evidence. We're generating new best practice. We're generating next pack practice through an innovation methodology. So Sanciel has also adopted this um, methodology and it's published on, on, I think there's white papers on the website and stuff like that, you can get it. Um, but basically it's this four steps that I talked about. And what's nice about it is at each step, there is a point where you stop, that's these blue dots where you stop and have some reflection on, you know, are we, meeting the criteria or the, the goals we set out to meet in that step. And if we're not, we need to pivot or we need to stop or we, we just need to learn from that experience. So prior to having kind of this type of really good methodology that makes you stop and reflect every step of the way, you may spend a long time getting to the point of testing only to find out it's not gonna work. 
because you didn't spend enough kind of time with some thoughtful reflection. So just gonna take you through this methodology a little bit. Uh, so for each step in the process, we have some activities or goals that we're trying to achieve in that step. Or I should probably also just tell you, the, the process stops with starts with either a problem. So you've identified a problem that you want to solve, or there could be a new product or a new opportunity that you want to consider. So both of those kind of go through the same methodology, but might have different activities that you do based on the step you're in. So the first step is framing the, the intent. So really trying to get a good understanding of the problem. So for example, there would be some goals that we're trying to make happen while we're doing the work in this phase. One is, do we really understand the users? Do we understand the context of the problem there from their point of view or from our point of view or from another stakeholder's point of view? And has anyone else addressed this problem? So doing an environmental scan and is, if they have, can we learn from them? Can we bring their solutions forward? So we're trying to form a hypothesis, look at any assumptions we're making, um, you know, frame the problem up so that we can present it to our, our innovation um, senior leadership team to make sure that they're willing and, and want us to move forward. So this is helping us to identify, is this desirable? Is this a desirable problem for us to solve? Or we do different things if we're looking at, is it a solution? That's kind of this bottom, is this the bottom side? So same kind of work, understanding the environment and the context, but there could be some different uh, questions that we're asking ourselves. So in order to get to these goals, we have a whole bunch of questions that we work through. Still on just understanding the problem. So do we have a working hypothesis of the problem? Is it aligned with our vision of hope and happiness? Does it present an opportunity? And how big is that opportunity for SE Health, for example? Uh, do we have a good gut feeling? So we haven't come to the solution yet, but we've got just starting to formulate a little bit of a, some ideas around this problem and is it right for SE Health? And then when we're going to this reflection points, so we're, we're wanting to make sure that we have the intent of the innovation, we have a problem statement, we have our vision for success, what would success, so we have this, the problem and what the solution or the, the success will look like, but we don't actually know the solution yet. We haven't gotten to that. What we're hoping that whatever solution we create supports that vision at the end and our assumptions. So now we've present, we've reflected on it, we've presented, everyone thinks, yep, we're on the right track. So then we go into the second step, which was that deep dive. Same idea, here's a whole bunch of goals that we're trying to, um, and information that we've got to collect during this phase. So is there any existing research? Is there, um, do we really understand the stakeholders? And this is where we start to bring stakeholders in and, um, who are we solving the problem for? Understanding that user experience. So I'm not gonna go through all of these, but you can see there's a whole bunch of stuff. We start to form a project plan or you know, early days, who needs to be a part of this team, those sorts of things. And then again, a whole bunch of questions that we wanna make sure we're answering in this phase. This phase takes a bit more time than the first phase. And then what are the outputs that we need in order to have that uh, thoughtful reflection before we move on to the third phase. So I'm not going to go through the, all of the phases because it's getting a little bit repetitive for you. But um, so there are four of those because there's four phases. We also have a toolkit um, that has a whole bunch of tools that innovation tools, design thinking, co-design tools that you can use uh, as you go through these different phases to do innovation within your organization. It's really helpful to um, have these available for your staff or for yourself. Um, they're, they're very accessible all over the, the internet, but the challenge on the internet is you don't know which ones to use when. And if you don't have a methodology, you know that won't help you either. But if you were to use a methodology and you know, uh, then you would want to align the tools for people to use. And they don't have to use all of them. They just use as many tools as they need to use to be able to uh, meet the goals of that phase they're in and create that kind of reflection document so that they're confident 
moving forward to the next stage or confident in deciding it's not viable or deciding it's not feasible or deciding it's not desirable. It's as hard to say no to something as it is to say yes. So this gives you what we call um, some intuitive confidence that, you know, with the best knowledge you, you can have, you know, you should go forward or with the best knowledge you have, you know, that you should stop either pivot or, you know, restart. You've gone down the wrong, you know, the wrong path. So this is great. All these tools are, these are a collection of tools that SE Health is, uses commonly as well that Sanciel uses. And um, we base our sort of innovation sprints on, on these. Innovation teams are also really important within an organization. You want to have um, usually about six to eight people stay on the team. We call them two pizza teams, as many people that could eat two pizzas. And um, the team doesn't stay the same team through the whole thing, depending on which phase you are, which, you know, deep dive solutioning, um, testing, you need different people, different subject matter experts as par uh, part of that team. So for example, uh, at the beginning, when you're planning, doing your deep dive and you're looking at evaluation criteria, you may want people who are from your research team involved, but then they, they'll go off while you're doing your solutioning and then they might come back on for the testing. So it's a bit of a dynamic team. <laughs> you want people who, who are the experts, who have expertise, in what you're trying to solve during that phase. We also have a way to um, just share all the products, projects that we're working on with the organization. And this allows us just to get continuous feedback. We use a tool called Trello. These are all little like hockey cards for each um, project we're working on and what phase they are in. So under frame intent, there's probably about 10 cards. You're only seeing a couple of them here. But anyone in the organization can click on a card and read what it's what we're working on and any updates that you know that um, we have on that particular project. <laughs> and they can also leave comments as well. Uh, we have cards under the deep dive, generating contest concepts and testing, and then a parking lot because sometimes something moves right from frame intent right over to the parking lot because it was determined to not be desirable. But we keep a history of it in case we, you know, timing is such that it might be better for us to look at it um, next year sort of thing. <clears throat> <I'm> sorry. <clears throat> One of the um, things that I think SE Health has done really well is embed in innovation in its culture. But not all organizations are like that. So it's important to kind of really look at, you know, your own organization and if you have people in your organization who fit any of these descriptions, it's going to be a challenge. So if you have the, your CEO is more of a chief idea killer versus somebody who wants to look at ideas and um, you know it embraces innovation, it's going to be hard to move things forward. It doesn't mean it's impossible, but you probably are going to need to have a strategy around, uh, you know, how you are convincing these people that this is the right thing to do. Um, part of the methodology though, I will say really helps uh, to change the, the minds of these individuals because you have the, you have um, included lots of thoughtfulness in what your request is. It's not just, we have a problem when we wanna solve it. We have a problem. This is who it's impacting. This is why it's significant. This is how we think it's going to impact SE Health or your organization. So you're really you're really learning how to pitch um, to people. The other thing that's important to remember when you're doing innovation within your organization is current. If you just do um, quality improvement initiatives, for example, and, you, and you've thought them they're well thought out, you typically see a bit of a straight line, maybe a little squiggly. Of a, of a line that, to, you know, based on where you are today and where you're headed and it's getting better over time. With innovation, it's a little bit different because it's it's not just a quality improvement. You're introducing new capabilities to your organization. Maybe there's new business models that need to be built, uh, but they're harder. So typically you have what the, we call this performance gap. So you start off 
And it gets a little bit worse before it gets better. And part of that is because there's so many learning that happen in here. Change management is huge and hard. Um, and depending on how big the, the change is that you're trying to make, this gap can be smaller or bigger. So typically you've got to come down because you're learning a lot and you're you're working with people and you're helping them get on the on the same train you're on. But then it takes off. The impact takes off. So if you can live through the performance gap, you will see the significant enhancements. But you have to be willing to take that time. And it's good to you know let your senior team know that this will happen first. You know this is going to happen, but this is good. This is good learnings and you know you might pivot a little bit you might iterate a little bit but then once it's right it's right so we want to make sure that we're always continuing to challenge the status quo and when we look at nurses you know we're so excited about innovation because we know that we're already MacGyvering the healthcare system nurses are natural innovators you know they they already think creatively they are very critical thinkers they're focused on solutions and most importantly they're they're so passionate about what they do you know that they're doing it for the right reasons next practice is really helping us when we look at living our best lives always so those of our clients those of our our colleagues, you know, those of their families. So it really is just augmenting clinical best practice with innovation or digital health technologies, but really with that focus on exceptional care and experiences everywhere. Just a couple of examples, you know, we are seeing it, the use of technology, these voice technologies with seniors um, quite frequently now as using them for reminders. We put, uh, we had one test we're, that we worked with a company called Memo Text and put these in the homes of seniors who are living alone. And every morning it would ask them how they're doing, ask them a few questions about, uh, about how they're doing. And based on their responses, our call center would be alerted if there was a, a abnormal response or they weren't feeling well or something. Then they would have a nurse call them, have a conversation. If need be, the nurse would then send one of our staff who live and work in the neighborhoods where all these people live over to the home to do a visit. So this was a huge change in business model uh, where typically our visits are scheduled, always scheduled with, with patients. They'll come and see on Tuesdays and Thursdays or Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Now this was more of a just-in-time model. You know, you're okay. If you need anything, we're here. And this, this tool was reminding them to take their meds and all those kinds of things. So it's a great way to kind of shift when we're looking at a shortage of health human resources to still give people the confidence that they, there's someone there for them when they're needed. And we're checking in on you every day, but instead of just showing up when on days when you don't need us, we're gonna show up when you really do need us. Um, we're seeing some great uh, stuff, interesting stuff with biometrics. Uh, one of the tools coming down the pipe is, um, you know, just using your phone to take a picture and it's automatically uh, collecting, I think, 35 different biometrics that, you know, can say what your temperature is, your blood pressure, your pulse, your blood sugar, your O2. So for nurses, this could be significant because all of those things take time. But if you could do it with a 20 second uh, picture of somebody's face and it gives them those those uh all those measurements, that could be a big time saver. And for home care nurses who now have to carry a bag with all those tools in them, um, you know, that makes the, the weight they're carrying around every day lighter as well. So this isn't Health, Can Health Canada approved yet, but I do think this type, tech, type of technology is going to be a game changer in healthcare. Another one that is really cool that we're working on is this Diabetes in the School program with Chio Hospital. And this was, identified by nurses who said uh, traditionally pre-COVID we used to go into people into schools and give children who were diabetic their insulin. Now there's not enough um, nurses to do that so that the the insulin regime of these children changed instead of getting their insulin twice three times a day they only got it twice a day. Now three four years post-COVID uh, the 
the hospitalists that their physicians are seeing changes in the wellness of these children. It's having an impact on their physical health and their mental health. So we worked with Chio Hospital to create a virtual in diabetes in the school program where we introduced a new type of care provider, a diabetes care technician and a virtual nurse. So the diabetes care technician is somebody who lives in the neighborhood who we've trained to do um, injections with pens and how to read blood glucose monitors, how to do a blood glucose uh, check. And then the they take the kid to the school, they meet at the school, the virtual nurse joins by video. The diabetic care technician does the blood sugar, shows the nurse, the nurse calculates the dosage, they dial it up on the pen, they show the nurse, and then the technician gives the child their um, insulin, all done in 15 minutes. So a great model, you know, new capabilities, new type of care provider, still uh, active, you know, the, can only work with nurses because we need the nurses are the eyes and the critical thinker, um, but at least it prevents that child not having their, their insulin every day. And um, it allows uh, nurses to see more patients. This one nurse who probably could only see one in a school per day because she'd have to get to another school can now do, you know, for an hour. Um, so it's a, it's a cool model. So again, another example that we're working to better together when we solve things together uh, with our partners in the healthcare system. So how will you future-proof? We're so excited, you know, Misty mentioned it, that we now have this partnership with the uh, CNA, SE Health, and Sanciel to really work together to amplify the voice of nursing innovation in Canada, to um, work with all of you, We'd love you know, more participation. Uh, Sanciel is the Society of Nursing Scientists, Innovator, Entrepreneur, Leaders. It was founded five years ago now in, um, in the US. I was the Canadian representation, representative on it and uh, so excited now to be building you know, Sanciel in Canada as well. But knowing that you know, we are stronger together. So when we look at why do we bring these three organizations together to do this, you know, CNA has been focusing on solving, you know, nursing issues, broad societal issues. They have national access to nurses, which is just phenomenal through their membership and relationships with provincial organizations. SE Health is focused on solving, again, nursing issues and broad society societal issues. We bring um, a research center, you strong innovation methodologies. We have an innovation um, lab and, and a future of aging group. So we bring up a whole bunch of different um, capabilities as well. And then Sanciel is really focused on solving nursing issues uh, with this network of experts who do innovation, whether they be entrepreneurs or intrapreneurs or scientists. So it's a really great group to be doing this. And our vision really is to see the full potential of nursing innovation that can be optimized by you know, harnessing the unique strengths and contributors of nurses that we've seen for hundreds of years, driving positive change, well-being, well and a healthy society for all Canadians. So we are committed to this um, collaboration. We want, really want to work together, work with all of you to figure out how we can help you and your organizations to move forward with um, nursing innovation. So some of the things that are already kind of on, on the uh, pipeline is um, we hosted a think tank with nursing leaders back in December and talked to them, uh, nursing leaders across Canada, talked to them about what would be important, how how might we do this as a, as a tri-council. And to start with, it was really, let's get the message out and let's provide some opportunities. So this webinar today, thank you CNA for, for uh, allowing me this time today, uh, is one. We are um, hosting in this fall, we're gonna host a Canadian Think Conference, which is Think is the Sanciel um, logo for the, the Health Innovation Nursing Conference. And we'll do that in partnership with um, Sanciel and CNA. And that'll be either in Toronto or Ottawa this fall, but it'll also have 
it's not, we won't, they're not just your typical conferences. There's always a big learning component. So um, last year we had a, and we'll be doing it this year, an innovation sprint first on day one, and then more discussion and learning uh, sort of on day two and sharing stories and stuff like that. So you, you get to work together through solving problems that you see to be important problems to solve. And then we um, are presenting this uh, similar message at the Canadian Health Leadership Conference uh, in a couple of weeks in Halifax. So uh, not just nurses, but to the health system that nurses are here and we are ready. And we are, we've got a, um, a network and an infrastructure to, to make this happen. So hopefully uh, your nursing leaders uh, or hospital leaders will be there and they'll hear this message with some some enthusiasm and come back and want to work very closely with you. And also just, you know, figuring out ways that we could continue to share our stories as these stories are phenomenal. We already have um, all, uh, lots of great examples in Canada and we want to make sure that nurses see themselves uh, as being very capable and able and must be at the innovation tables. So we do need you. We know that nursing innovation isn't a luxury. It is a necessity. We know that intelligent risk taking isn't the Wild West. It's well thought out, managed and required in order to move us forward. And nursing innovation is where compassion meets creativity and dedication sparks discovery. So on that note, just wanna say thank you for listening and really happy to um, answer any questions. Thank you, Mary Lou, what an inspiring uh, talk. Uh, I know there's so much that has been done in Canada, especially throughout COVID, as you highlighted, and so much more that is happening as we move forward. Uh, we do have some time for uh, questions for Mary Lou. If anyone has any that they'd like to bring forward, please just enter them into that Q&A box at the bottom black bar of your Zoom screen. Um, maybe to kick it off, Mary Lou, uh, the toolkit that you shared, the SE toolkit, is that available online for anyone to access? It's not really like a physical toolkit. It's um, mm -hmm. so we have we have some you know, those tools and a description of them and when you know when they might be best used. But it it's kind of circumstantial. Like even for our staff, I I don't just sort of really just give them the toolkit because it's really I want to understand what they're trying to achieve and then. Um, which tool might best be useful for them um, because there's different uh, there's so many different tools it'd be like um, me giving you my husband's toolkit which is huge and really what you want to do is take the tire off your bike you know it would be better if I helped you figure out okay that, that for that you just want this wrench and this air pump that's fair so awesome um, I know that for some nurses, uh, they feel like they can't impact change if they're just one person or, or um, if they see a need for change or a need for innovation as a frontline nurse, they sometimes don't know where to even start. Uh, what can a frontline or, or uh, any nurse, for that matter, really encourage innovation at the organization level? Like where, where would you encourage them to start? I think starting with the problem is the most important or what you're trying to solve. So this could be a problem or an opportunity and both are of value, but typically um, you gain a bit more credibility if you're solving a current problem, because, and I'll tell you why, if you're just coming, there's so many opportunities out there. There's so many cool, shiny objects that um, you could bring into your organization, but it, it's the, it does, you know, the, quick, the quick answer or response to that will be, it's not a priority right now. It's not a priority right now. But if you're solving a problem, a current problem, that must be a priority. You know, it's hard to say a problem, you know, I want to solve this problem and someone say, well, that's not a priority. Well, it is a kind of significant problem. So it's really understanding you taking the time to understand the problem and, and validating that you're understanding that problem with other nurses, you know, so it's not just, I see that this is a problem, but I, I, I have spoken with, you know, 15 other people or 10 other people. This is what we really see as being the problem. And this is where the, the vision for, you know, what we see at the end, if we could solve this problem, you know, it would get rid of these three, these three things. 
Um, and then you you unfortunately need to go up that that ladder or that org chart. So, you know, hopefully not having hopefully your org chart doesn't look like the one I showed you. Uh, <laughs> Because you do want to find those champions, and there, and if your manager isn't the champion, but you know somebody else is, um, you might have a side conversation with them first, just to get. And you could you can frame that up as, "I'm just looking for some advice. I know you love in innovation, but Misty's not a big fan, but I want her to be a fan badly because this is a problem, and we can really solve it. So, any advice on how I might approach Miss, Misty on this? So, finding your mentors, uh, finding your champions, and um, get, getting advice and, you know, Sancio has all kinds of, um, it's a great network if you're not a member and you, and you are interested in nursing innovation, it, it's a, a great opportunity to reach out and get advice from others who are going through what you're going through too. Absolutely. Um, this next question is in regards to the, uh, the four examples of innovations that you shared, specifically the aging in place daily check-in. How does one um, learn more about those, those uh, ideas or, or be able to mm. get someone in touch with them? Yeah, so well, if you're interested in that one, you can reach out to me in particular. But in, I think one, this is one of the, the reasons why CNA and uh, why we're forming this sort of Council for Nursing Innovation in Canada, because there's, you know, those were four examples, but there are a lot of examples where nurses are doing some wonderful things. And we want to work on how do we, a, a way to share those stories with you so that for motivation, but also why not, you know, why not spread them around? So uh, we don't have that figured out yet. Misty and I and, and uh, Nico are working on that, whether it'll be a um, a repository somewhere or, or more of these types of webinars where people are coming on and sharing their great stories. You know, we could have four or five of them, uh, just making sure that we're, we're sharing what we're doing. Cause I think that that's our biggest loss right now is we're not sharing what we're doing. Agreed. It's really just highlighting and often these innovative programs seem to come forward at like conference presentations, but then they're only really speaking to the few hundred people that are able to attend those conferences and uh, mm -hmm. really being able to highlight these innovative uh, programs and ideas that are happening around Canada, I think is, is something mm -hmm. that we can do fairly easily. And I'm uh, excited to keep working on that with you, Mary Lou. So yeah. stay tuned. We'll have some more information soon. <laughs> Great. Um, this next question is, uh, you spoke a little bit about nurse scientists or nurse researchers or even nursing informatics. What are some things that we can do to propagate awareness about these specialized non-traditional bedside roles? Um, a lot of nursing students seem to be surprised that these exist. Is there a way that you foresee we could integrate these roles better into our RN programs? Um, that's a great question. I know there's nothing formal and you're right. I think, uh, I'm not sure why they, why we don't talk more about these roles. They're just things that you kind of find out or bump into somebody and you're like, Oh, that's kind of interesting that you do that. How, how'd you do that? How'd you get there? Um, you know, the RNAO has their interest groups. Like if you are interested in those, but they're, they're not all of those. Um, I don't know. I would. I maybe. Maybe it's a good. Maybe it's something that we should be taking on with our our group. Is how do we is to how do we bring in the colleges and the universities, and we we're letting them know about this type of work and uh, maybe especially this one because in nursing innovation is is a little bit newer than say nursing informatics. It's a pretty well established role now, uh, but twenty years ago it wasn't. So hopefully, uh, but I'm still not sure that if they teach any of that in the universities, it's been years since I've been to university. <laughs> but I think we can, we could, we should make them a, a one of our stakeholders mm -hmm. as we go forward. Uh, this next what question, um, you touched on this a bit, but maybe you could delve a bit deeper. Can you share some of the challenges you faced in overcoming leadership resistance and how you've worked with leaders to move them into an openness to innovation activities? Um, this person's asking particularly in the context of working with a common argument that in this 
uh, today's climate, the HHR scarcity, nurses can't be relied on to do innovation because they need to be bedside caring for patients. Yeah, that's a hard message for nurses to hear because if we don't, so my my concern about that message, and I hear it all the time, <laughs> is if we don't find a way to free nurses up to help us solve these problems, help us solve the HHR problem, we won't solve it without nurses at the table. And we're trying to, and it's take, we've been talking about it now for 10 years. So, and it's only getting worse. So it had, SE Health luckily is very supportive and makes the time because they, it's part, uh, they believe, they know that if we're solving a nursing problem and we don't have nurses at the table, that in itself is a problem if they're not a part of it. Even if we're looking at um, nursing technology, like uh, digital health stuff, if I'm working with a vendor and they don't have, and they claim that they got a tool for nurses and they don't have any nurses on their team or nurse advisors as part of their product development, I don't even have a second conversation because I know it's not going to work. So that we, I think the questions I would ask though in response to that, if, they, if the response is, you know, with the health human resources, we can't free you up. I would probably go back with a response of, if you're solving for nurses without nurses, do you, you know, how do you think it's going to end? You know, do you really think you can solve the problem without nurses? And if so, how? And I think we have to be almost bold enough to keep saying that because um, we won't, I, I truly do not believe, the greatest changes I've seen have been because nurses have driven them forward. It's true. When you look at our history in Canada and what we've done, it's uh, it's something right. to be proud of <laughs> and the innovations that we've already done, maybe unknowingly or maybe just little bits, but over the years, how it's added up um, yeah. to bring changes. And uh, it's exciting to be able to see this work propel forward into the future. Right. And I wonder if it might be possible, and this is a bit hard until you've gotten a little bit of because you understand the problem kind of in that first phase and you get a sense of what it, a, a small sense of what it's going to take. But I think when you're asking for time or you want to be involved in something, um, if you could get a sense of what that commitment is going to need to be like, we don't, I don't take nurses out of the field for weeks at a time. I'm meeting with them. I'm making like, I, you know, we're meeting virtually one hour a week you know, to, or maybe we've got one half day where we're doing design thinking, and then maybe three months later, we're doing another half day of, you know, some co-design stuff, but a lot we're doing virtually, like we're doing it quickly. We're not wasting time. You know, if people are there, we're showing up where we know exactly we're focused because people are passionate about it. And so they're focused and they're getting it done. Um, so I, I, I think people, maybe, maybe these people think it's going to take forever which it doesn't, it's, if you do it right, if you have dedicated time when it's needed, you know, full day, half day, you can get a ton done versus off the side of your desk for three years, still trying to figure out the problem. <laughs> so true. <laughs> um, thank you, Mary Lou, for again, for sharing your story, for sharing the great work that you're doing with both Etsy Health Social and us here at CNA. I'm very excited to move our partnership forward. Uh, again, just as a reminder for everyone, if you want to reflect on this webinar, rewatch it or even share it with your colleagues, it will be available online. Um, and uh, with that, uh, we'll just have a few words in closing, just a reminder to any CNA members that may be in attendance, or if you're interested in becoming a CNA member, our annual general meeting is coming up and we do have an opportunity to elect a new president elect and a vice president in June. Um, an, a special uh, event to meet the candidates for those positions is open and available for members only. Uh, this session will occur tomorrow between 12 and 1 p.m. Eastern time, um, where you'll be able to ask questions and hear about the platforms that each of these individuals are campaigning on. So meet the candidates Farah Khan, Kimberly Helen Lamarche, uh, Tracy Riesling and Bukola Salami as they share their vision for CNA and answer questions about their leadership philosophy.
Another reminder is CNA is having a scavenger hunt each day this week. Today we're on question number three, which you'll see on the slide here. If you think you know the answer, if you have some time to go find the answer on our website, this is open to all nurses, whether you're CNA members or not. Um, just click the link in any of our social media posts, LinkedIn, um, Facebook, and uh, Instagram, and you'll be able to uh, submit your answer and win one of our wonderful prizes uh, that are sponsored through CeraVe and the Gritty Nurses. And also next week, if you've enjoyed this session or the one that we had on Monday, we are having another webinar uh, to honor nurses. And this one is on emp nursing empowerment through therapeutic healing, um, therapeutic writing, which will offer healing, reflection, and resilience uh, with Lori Rosegro Rosegrove uh, next Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. With that, thank you all for joining again, and I wish you all a very happy nursing week, and I hope that you are taking time to participate in some more activities. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.